we're going to turn to our Bibles now, please, to the Word of God, and we're going to turn to four Scriptures this morning, and four Scriptures links together everything that the Lord wants to speak to us. And we're turning, first of all, to Numbers, and we're in the Numbers chapter number 16, please. Numbers chapter 16. Every book, we're turning to four different books this morning, and every book we're turning to the 16th chapter, and we're first of all turning to number 16. And number 16, verse 44. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Get you up from among this congregation, that I may consume them as in a moment. And they fell upon their faces. And Moses said unto Aaron, Take a censer and put fire therein from off the altar, and put on incense, and go quickly unto the congregation, and make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord, the plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded, and ran into the midst of the congregation, and behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on incense and made an atonement for the people, and he stood between the dead and the living, and the plague was stead. And they that died in the plague were fourteen thousand and seven hundred, beside them that died about the matter of Korah. That's number sixteen. Now come with me to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter sixteen. The Acts of the Apostles, chapter sixteen. Now we all know the story in Acts sixteen very well, don't we? Paul and Silas are in prison. And in Acts 16 and verse 25, we read, And at midnight Paul and Silas prayed, and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and every one's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prisoner, waking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. And then he called for a light and sprang in and, and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. Now come with me to Mark's Gospel, chapter 16, please. Mark's Gospel, 16. And these are the final words of the Lord Jesus before he returns back up into heaven. And in Mark 16, verse 15, we read these words. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. One final reading. This time it's Luke's Gospel 16. Luke's Gospel 16. And we all know the story here, don't we? And you know the story of the rich man. He's in hell now. He has died and he's been buried and now he's in hell. And in verse 27, this is what we read of the rich man when he's in hell. Then he said, I pray thee, therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him, that's Lazarus, to my father's house. For I have five brethren, 
and that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. And he said unto them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. And we know that the Lord will add His blessing upon those four readings in His own, from His own precious truth. It was during the dark days of the American Civil War, the darkest days of the American Civil War, when there was a spiritual revival broke out among the ranks of the Confederate Army. Many of those young men who were fighting were wonderfully and gloriously saved even during the darkest hours of the American Civil War. Many of those young Confederate soldiers were wonderfully saved. And the reason for the outbreak of this revival, even in the midst of war among the American soldiers, was because many of its great generals were believers. And one man stands out, his name was Lieutenant General Leon Polk. That was his name. And even though he was a lieutenant general in the, uh, in the Confederate Army, Leon Polk, Lieutenant General Leon Polk, even though he held that high rank, he saw to it that every soldier under his command would be one for Christ. Leon Polk, Lieutenant General Leon Polk, sought out and saw many of those young men come to the Savior. And he not only saw them saved, he saw them baptized too. You know, sometimes I think we have divorced baptism from salvation. Baptism doesn't save, but it's an outward sign that you are saved. During a battle, Lieutenant General Leon Polk was was fatally wounded. And a young soldier that he led to the Lord just a few days before this found his dead body. And going through his pockets for any personal belongings, this young soldier discovered a testament and a wee booklet inside the testament that was called Balm for the Sin-Sick Soul. And Lee, Lieutenant General Leon Polk was a living testimony. He was known as the fighting bishop. He was a bishop. And the testimony that he left behind was this. Every soldier of every rank loved him and admired him for his faith. I wonder, dear child of God, when was the last time you sought somebody out for the Savior? When was the last time you told someone of John 3 and verse 16? When was the last time you handed someone a gospel tract? And told them that God loves them? 
You know, we are coming up to a mission. And God wants to show us this morning from these four readings, four ways, four calls on how to be energized for evangelism. Do you know the heartbeat behind evangelism? It's not a man preaching. The heartbeat that drives evangelism is the sobbing heart of God over sinners that are lost in their sin. The heartbeat behind evangelism is the anguishing cry of the Lord Jesus over a city that wouldn't repent. John Knox found it like this. He said, give me Scotland or I die. John Wesley cried, the world is my parish that must be won for Christ. wonder what your cry is, child of God, I, and I wonder what mine is. Four calls comes from the Word of God for you and I to be energized this morning for evangelism, and energized to seek out the lost for the Lord Jesus. Four calls. Numbers chapter 16, you learn there, first of all, the call comes from within. The children of Israel were murmuring against Moses and against Aaron, and God didn't like it. And God sent judgment upon the people. It's a dangerous thing to talk against the servants of God. And the plague had commenced, and the congregation were starting to perish. They were starting to die. And you read carefully into Numbers chapter 16, and you'll find that Moses was moved for the people that were perishing. You know, friends, Moses had a feeling. He had this burden within him that called him to do something, to stand the hand of God's judgment. Do you know, dear child of God, this morning, there's a coming day of judgment very soon? Let's remember this morning, child of God, that what the Scripture says. The Scripture says it is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. And dear child of God, this morning, what we have to realize is this. When people die, it doesn't end with Jimmy on it. It doesn't end for them in the coffin. It doesn't end for them in the grave. They face the fires of hell, everlasting torment will be theirs. And if you're in this meeting this morning, unsaved friend, Friend, it won't end with you, with Jimmy, and it won't end for you at the coffin, and it won't end for you up at the mill road. Judgment awaits you, and it's God's divine judgment. And God hates sin this morning. You thank God that you're still here. And you thank God this morning you still have time to come to the Lord Jesus because He's the only Savior of sinners. This church can't save you. I can't save you. William John can't save you. There's only one who can save you this morning, and that's the Lord Jesus. Come to the Lord Jesus. I'm pleading with you, unsaved friend. Come and come today. 
I can't force you to come. But I can pray that you will come and I can plead for you to come. Moses saw the need. And we read, we read that Moses stood between the dead and the living to stop the plague. Something within his heart, something within his soul, something says we just can't let this happen, stand back and do nothing. Unsafe friend. If you're a neighbor that's not saved, judgment is going to take them out someday. If you're a mother or a father and they're not saved yet, judgment's going to take them out someday. If you're an aunt or an uncle or a cousin, judgment's going to take them out some of these days. And are we prepared to sit back and do nothing and let it happen? Every believer is commissioned to do something and to tell others of Jesus. And the moment Moses stood between the living and the dead, the plague was stopped, and there was people saved from further judgment. When was the last time you shared the gospel with someone? You know, I led a a lady to the Lord the first Tuesday night of the Coke Mission. A young lady called Heather Young. And before that week was out, she saw the need. She had her mother out. And she had her husband out. And she had her sister out. She saw the need that they need to come. And thank God, last Lord's Day evening, I knelt with Heather again, this time to lead her husband to the Lord and to lead her sister to the Lord about an hour after it. Oh, friend, is there something within you that tells you you need to do something? If you don't, you need to go home and pray that God would give you that call, the call from within Then in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter number 16, you don't have the call from within there. You've got the call from without. Paul and Silas, they were in the prison. And as Paul and Silas were in the prison, you remember the story, this stone-cold face, hard-hearted jailer who had no time for God, And he had no time for the gospel either. And he had no time for Paul and Silas. Two minutes to midnight, he had no time nor thought for God. No time nor thought for the gospel. And I'll tell you this, he had no concern for a soul either. Until God done something that awakened him, you know. And that's what we need to pray this week coming out, that God will awaken people out the Cranfield Road. And God can awaken them. And God can arouse sinners out of their slumber and sleep of death. And we need to believe it, if you can. And this man at 30 seconds to midnight, there he is, fast asleep, no time for God. And God sent an earthquake, and he awoke out of his sleep.
That's what we need to pray for in these days. No riff-raffing and playing and coming out with the same rituality prayers at all. We need to get on our knees and say, God, you move! I was at the, William, John, and I were at the council meeting yesterday, and there's more men stood up and talked, and they waffled until Pastor Harry Dodge got up. And Pastor Dodge came up to the front. He says, I'll tell you what we need. We need an outpouring of God, the Holy Spirit. That's what we need. And that's what we need in these days. And this man this morning, this man, the jailer, friend, God awakened him. God can awaken sinners. And God can break them too. And I would say it wouldn't have been long after midnight. I would say about a minute. Here's this man, and he's trembling now. And he falls at the feet of Paul and Silas, and he cries out, What must I do to be saved? Do you know what I'm concerned about today? I'm concerned about this. I believe there are some pastors, never mind Christians, that have a seeking soul came to be counseled. I wonder could they lead them to the Lord? Would they know what to say? You know, friends, let me say something this morning. There's people outside these four walls, and they're certain, I'm telling you, they're certain. Andy's here this morning, and Tracy and Rachel down there. And they go out in the streets of Lurgan outside nightclubs, and I'll tell you, there's people coming out, and they're searching. I used to go out myself along with Tracy in the cleft away back there many years ago. And young people coming out, and I'll tell you, they're searching. They're crying out for life. They're crying out for hope. They're crying out for reality. You know what the problem is? The problem is they're looking for the right thing, but they're looking for it in the wrong place. There's a call from without these four walls. From people who need the Savior. You heard that call. And it says in Luke 16, it says in Luke 16 that Paul and Silas not only spoke the word of the Lord unto him, but to all that were in his house, the call from without. Ben Ford, who was a detective in the RUC, sat with many hardened criminals over, over the desk in the question and center in, in Castlereagh, and he says, many of them were so guilty, blood dripping from their hands, but they were crying out. They were crying out for mercy. They were crying out for hope. And there's people all around us today crying out for mercy, crying out for hope, and they can't find it. And the call comes this morning to you, and it comes to me to tell them where real hope and real life can be found. That's what they call this mission, real life and real hope. Number 16, the call from within. Act 16, the call from without. Mark 16, the call from above. Because the Lord Jesus in Mark 16 says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. You're to go into all the world. Nobody's to be left out. Do you remember the Lord Jesus in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1? Do you know what he said? 
ye shall be my witnesses. First of all in Jerusalem, then Judea, then Samaria. Have you witnessed in Jerusalem? Witnessing in Jerusalem is telling those in your home that they need the Lord. If you have no burden for Jerusalem, you needn't be telling me you have a burden anywhere else. When the Lord Jesus says we're to tell them, and then you've got Judea, and then you've got Samaria, the places where we don't like to go. Remember a man sharing his testimony one night. He was on his knees, and he prayed, Lord, send me somewhere. And the place where the Lord wanted him to go, and the person to whom the Lord wanted him to go, he says, Lord, don't send me there. I'm not going to mention the person's name, and I'm not going to mention the political party, but you can guess it. And this office was on the Falls Road. He says, and I want you to go and tell him who holds the rank of president. Tell him that God loves him. And he didn't want to do it. And the more he prayed, the burden got heavier. And he went up to the Falls Road, and he went into the constituency office where he knew he was there said to the man at the front, he says, I'm here to see so-and-so. Well, he says, you've got a 10-minute slot in five minutes. And he was standing there in fear and trembling. He actually feared for his own life. He went in, and he sat down, and he told this person, listen, I'm here to tell you that God loves you, and Christ died for you as much as he died for anybody else. And he took out the wee journey of life booklet. You know the wee journey of life? And he started going through it all about sin and about salvation. And all of a sudden, the door opened, and the man says, I'm sorry, sir, your time's up now. And this person says, I'll tell when this man's time's up. You know what that man said? He sat there for another 45 minutes asking questions about the Lord. Nobody in this world, no matter who they are, and nobody in this world, no matter what they've done, must be left out in telling them the good news that Jesus saved. Go ye into all the world. Tracy and I knew a fellow called Graham Lawther. Graham was involved in loyalist terrorism during the Troubles. And he got gloriously saved in the Crumlin Road prison, and he had all the tattoos in his fingers and in his arms. And after he got saved, God gave him a burden for every home on the Falls Road. And he used to go and get tracks, and every night, in the middle of the morning, he used to go and put tracks through the door. Of before the, it, it, He didn't want them to see them with the tattoos. And he paid big money to get tattoos off his arms so that he could go in daily. I'm telling you, child of God, we need to wake up to the fact there's people perishing all around us. There's the call from within. There's the call from without. There's the call from above. Luke 16, the call from beneath. The rich man in hell. Send Lazarus to my father's house. I'll tell you this, sadly, there's too many Christians today that have no interest in evangelism. No interest in reaching the lost, I'll tell you. They're interested in hell, all right. They're interested in hell, all right. 
And if any call that should energize you and energize me for evangelism, listen to the call from beneath. Send Lazarus to my father's house. I have five brethren. Son, and that he may go and tell them, lest they come to this place of torment. Do you know who Lazarus' five brethren have to tell them? They have you and me to tell them. And this mission, this mission, I don't want this to sound the way it sounds, but this mission could be the answer of somebody's cry in hell. And we're going out, and we're not going to preach Baptist. We're going out to tell them that they need to be saved. And we're going out to tell them of one who died on the cross. And we're going to tell them where real life and real hope and real peace is found. It's too serious to ignore, you know. Far too serious to ignore. Maybe there's a Heather Parks here this morning. A Heather Parks. You don't know who Heather Parks is, but I'll tell you who she is. She's a lady who's a member in Coke Baptist. It was her that brought Heather to the mission. And it was her that sat with us as we counseled her. And it was her that knelt with us as we led her to the Lord. And it was Heather Marks who was there last Lord's Day evening kneeling again beside Heather as we led her husband to the Lord. And when Tracy and I, when the whole thing was over and we parted company, we, we went home to a friend's house in Cook to, to have supper. And I was about to sit down to the table where we were on our way to the kitchen and the door knocked. Who was it? It was Heather Marks. You may come quick, she says. There's another woman who's come back to the tent, needs to talk to you. I grabbed my Bible on the way up to the tent, and it was Heather's sister. The Heather, the lady that got saved, it was now her sister. And Heather Marks was there again, kneeling with us as we led her sister to the Lord, this girl's sister to the Lord. I was speaking to Heather Marks' husband, Ronnie, this week. And she says, Heather saw that mission as a revival within her own soul. And you don't know who you may have the privilege of kneeling with in the next two weeks. You pray for some person, won't you? Ask the Lord to lay someone on your heart. And just don't come without anybody. Bring on, save them. It's hard enough to preach to the converted. This mission's for you as much as it is for me. And may we see as we did in other missions that we did here. May we see others oh, one for the Savior. May we be energized. For evangelism in these days, may we hear the call from within, the call from without, the call from above, the call from beneath, before the Lord come. Let's win the loss for Christ. God bless His Word to our hearts this morning. Our closing hymn.